So thanks again for this nice introduction. And as you can see from the title, what I want to talk today about is how to exploit machine learning model predictive and especially on having instability. So what is the main purpose? What is the motivation for this talk? So if you look in today's environment, you actually see a lot of autonomous systems popping up. For example, autonomous cars here, uh, where you might have a leader system or camera systems and they should go along a road. You might have a medical robot who should perform an operation. You will see this later on. Or we might have a drone which should follow along a certain track or even a chemical plant, like here, a plant for producing out of electrical energy, synthetic gas. So there are actually many things involved. If you want to have something like this one operating autonomously, you need to percept, you need to uh, look at an environment, you need to plan, like shown down here, and also control plays an elementary role because it allows you to kind of fight at least a little bit uncertainty. And uh, this is actually one of the challenges. So uh, these autonomous systems should adapt to the environment, they should learn, they just adjust. And even so, that we have been uh, looking at these things from the control side, these things are still limited. For example, this person here might change its move, might suddenly go in this direction and you need to replan. The same thing with the drone, you might have wind acting and now your system needs to react and should avoid this object replan and control. And at the same time, for example, up here you might have this uh, medical system and it should counteract all the disturbances from the patient like the patient moving. So this is uh, a challenging thing. And as I mentioned, even though that these things have been always part of the control loop, we are somehow blocked. So classical adaptive tools don't work that well. Uh, just adapting the model is also maybe not a way. So the question is, can't we exploit machine learning for that? And as we have seen over the past decades, there has been significant advancements in the area of machine learning. Deep learning has appeared. Other approaches like Gaussian processes are widely used. Reinforcement learning, end, end, end. And this is actually mainly driven by the availability of a lot of data in some cases, uh, by large distributed maybe even cloud-based computing resources for learning, and also by big companies like Amazon and Google who are interested by this because they want to use it for their own purposes and they see a lot of things. And they also drive the development of software tools like TensorFlow and Tyshirt. However, you also need to realize these approaches are in the moment mainly used for image processing, learning customer demands, or for example, uh, also autonomous driving partially. So far, they have not really intruded control or uh, there are not that many real world control applications. And the fact for this is, why? Because it's very difficult to provide guarantees. So if you have a robot who is operating, it should not hit the patient. It should not cut in the wrong organ. Or here, this robot should not collide with this person. And this is actually the main purpose of this talk. How can we fuse methods from control with machine learning approaches while providing stability, performance, transparency, and at the same time also exploiting model knowledge. And I don't want to do that in a big frame, not for all possibilities. I want to do that in a frame of model predictive control. And most of you are aware with model predictive control. Model predictive control is nothing else than you obtain a state, the information here, you look forward with a model based on this information, you predict the future, and you optimize the input, you select an optimal input, and then you move a little bit along that path and you repeat that. So it's actually nothing else than repeated optimization based or optimal control, or repeated control based on repeated prediction. Okay, so I want to look at this very specifically. Why do I want to look at this uh, very specifically? Well, it's very easy because model predictive control allows you a lot of things. You can formulate it in a rigorous mathematical sense, for example, here is a discrete optimal control problem where you're optimizing your input, input sequence here, over this rolling horizon, looking into the future, where you're optimizing this cost subject to your model. So you can use pre-knowledge, something like this. I can use model knowledge, I can use preview information of disturbances. I can include constraints on states and inputs, so I can ensure safety. 
I have flexibility, I can use different kind of models, I can adapt these models. And last but not least, we have a very rich theoretical base and also very efficient optimization strategies. So, how do I want to fuse that with uh, learning? What is the kind of way I want to do that? Do I just want to replace MPC? Maybe let's look a little bit more in detail. So that's the classical control loop with an MPC controller where we use a model. And the system here, which has some uncertainties, and we have a lot of advantage. Also, this for example here, it's rather challenging to handle large changes. So if you would replace this with a purely learning-based approach, like shown here, then we could actually base this on data, so we don't need the physical model. But there's also a lot of challenges. What is the physical insight? Where do we get the data, data from? And how can we guarantee things without retraining? How can we guarantee things at all? And this is exactly what I want to look at. I want to not use one of the both approaches. I want to fuse these both approaches. And I want to use learning in MPC. So what does this mean? Uh, what you will see in the following is actually we will use learning for different aspects of predictive control. As we have seen in predictive control, we have cost functions, we have constraints, we have models. And I want to start up with looking at references and disturbances and how can we learn those? What can we achieve with those? How can we provide guarantee? Then I want to focus a little bit on system models. And after we have seen that, I want to give you a little bit an outlook on can't we learn the controller in a very specific setup. And this also brings me to the very important point that I will not give you a review. So I'm not claiming to include all references here. Rather, we decided while preparing this talk that we're actually kind of putting up these references. And I only want to point out there are much too many to kind of point out at the specific points. You can talk about learning and references. You can talk about verification of learned controllers and, and, and. So I will in the following not focus that much on existing works. I only want to tell you a personal story. So things we have been looking at. And I want to split that up in three parts. In the first part, as I said, we want to focus on references and disturbances. And for this one, we will focus at the beginning at a specific medical robotics application. Then I want to turn the object to how can we learn system dynamics itself? And how can we enforce stability? And then the last part, I want to give you a little bit an outline on how we can learn control. Maybe the take home message from today is that fusing these two things together is very good. It allows you to achieve a lot of things. It's promising and we can also provide guarantees. So this is my take home message. Okay, maybe let's look a little bit more in detail on the first part. So learning references and learning disturbances. And I want to motivate that with a project we have been working on in the frame of a research campus stimulate. And that's actually removing a tumor here in the spinal cord, so this is the tumor, by term ablation. So you enter needles, these patients are terminal ill, you enter the needle and then you heat with electricity to kill the tumor. So the challenge here is actually you need to enter these needles very precise and the moment this is done by hand. So the idea is uh, can't we do that with control and can't we do that with a robot? So can't not a robot kind of enter these needles at the positions, then we do the treatment and so on. So here you see Jenny Macek talking to another scientist and this is the kind of configuration here. You have a robot and this robot will actually in the first task support the patient, uh, the uh, doctor. So what we are looking at robot supported intervention. And if you look at that, there's actually tons of things to look at. Here you see actually how this uh, operates. So you see here, this is taking an image. Then after the image is done, there's actually a planning of the operation. So you can talk about therapy planning. How do you want to enter the needle? How do you need to enter the needle and so on? And then the robot comes in the task and the question comes up, how do we do that? How do we kind of control this robot? That's exactly what we looked at. So uh, we looked at therapy planning. We looked at how we do the uh, a chess of the pass with guiding the doctor, not the robot doing that. And also looking into the future, how do we limit forces? 
So this is something we have been looking. So we looked at force feedback control. I only want to give you a full story. And we did do that with predictive force control. And just as a review, very important here, uh, force feedback here means is that you actually want to enter this needle. And this can be seen as a problem of letting a kind of control system follow a path here this red time. And it's important that this is actually not a tracking problem, so you don't want to follow a time signal. This is actually a path following problem. So you actually want to follow a path. The time is not important. And if you do formulate it in a path following manner, then you actually have a lot of advantages. That's what we have shown. So you can actually achieve stability, you can achieve good performance, and so on. So this is already a couple of years ago. You can formulate this as an MPC problem, as shown here, here in continuous time. Here you have the model, uh, here you have the path following problem, uh, and here you have actual constraints on forces. So this is a force feedback path following control problem. And if you do it like that, you can solve that repeatedly and you can actually achieve kind of very good results and you can show rigorous stability. So for example here, that's an example. Here you see a robot drawing on a board. Let me go back and let me start it again. Experimental validation. So the robot is actually drawing on the board. And the challenging task here, it's actually controlling its force and it is following this path. So in a certain sense, this is very similar to entering this needle. So this is just an example that with predictive control, you can tackle such problems. So you can tackle these problems where uh, you have uh, disturbances, you don't know the, back, uh, the, the, the surface, you want to keep the force constant, and at the same time you can do that also in real time. However, there's also a challenge. This is not all to the story. So, so far we only discussed about these things. And there's one very important point, this is actually the point of movement compensation. So how do I compensate movements? Because the patient will be moving, he will be breathing. And this is actually the purpose of the following minutes. We want to focus on using learning to kind of uh, compensate these movement, movements. So we want to have a combined controller out of a predictive controller and allow a learned controller for achieving good constraint by this one. So what is the basic idea here? Here, the basic idea is actually shown in this image here. Here we have the patient. We might measure it uh, with this thing here. And you wonder why not only do the control? Why do you want to learn these references? Why you want to learn these disturbances? Because you might have a blocking of this thing here. So this we give actual uh, to the reference disturbance prediction. This we do with learning, and this is then fed to the robot. Another question comes up: with How do you want to learn that? How do you want to learn these uh, disturbances, these oscillations? And there are various ways we have used and tried a lot of them. And actually we decided in the end to use Gaussian processes. Gaussian processes allow you to predict on old information into the future. And they also give you some uh, preview information. Let me give a little bit more background on Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes are more or less a generalization of what you know from Gaussian distributions to functional space. Here this is our GP. It has a mean function, it has a causal variance. So you might consider it like the following. You want to, you have kind of these uh, dotted points and you kind of want to fit a function through it to look maybe into the future, to look on this side. And this actually you can do with a Gaussian process. And this is actually a learning strategy. What you also get from this learning is a confidence interval. Here, this little gray thing down here, uh, which gives you a little bit more confidence and tells you the 95% confidence area if you have done things correctly. What is the advantage of Gaussian process-based learning? It's actually a so-called non-parametric approach. We don't need a model. We can have a model. Normally, it's called to be robust against overfitting. And it kind of provides you this uh, estimate of uncertainty, which you could use in control, which we will not use. And we will actually use this as a reference generator, a reference generator for the breathing. This is the breathing. And we want to uh, look from past observations in kind of a moving window thing into the future. So how does this look like? This looks a little bit complicated. Here's the robot. And actually what you see here, this is the 
offline phase and this down here is the online phase and here we have the learning this is done with this Gaussian process and here we have the model predictive controller uh, which is kind of using this forward information. So the setup actually is that you in a first step learn from data you got from the patient and old patients and here we did do that actually we learned six independent GPs because we need those for the robot. The robot is actually a seven degree robotic manipulator and uh, we also have the regressor as the time. The mean is actual uh, at the beginning and to be assumed to be constant. Now you can actually also include further information. And what are the further informations? Pre-knowledge. You can, for example, include that this breathing operation is uh, quasi-periodic. And if you do that, you actually select some very specific basis functions and then you can kind of include that you expect something oscillating. Now if you do that, this is what you actually get. So here this is kind of the window and with this window of information you can actually look a little bit into the future. This is blue here. And it actually turns out that this is real breathing information of real patients, of a real patient. It actually turns out uh, that the GP is very nicely to predict and that it also removes the noise. So it allows us to look into the future. And now if you do that in this operation, this is how this would look like in the closed loop with the controller. So the controller now gets this reference, gets this disturbance. We actually achieve very good results. Uh, we actually achieve maximum errors of 0.3 millimeters. I should say this is simulations with a very realistic robot model and also 0 .0 0.3 uh, degrees uh, of precision in the angles. So here you have the reference and that's the needle tip and you see actually move very nice. So the learning supported MPC uh, with the motion compensation by learning actually allows us a very precise tracking. But wait a second, I have been talking about providing guarantees. There are no guarantees yet. So the actual question actually comes up, can we enforce uh, guarantees? Can we enforce uh, repeated feasibility? And can we enforce stability of the closed loop? And actually, yes, you can do that. And actually, the idea here is that for stability, we should actually have very specific uh, trajectories which the controller actually can track. So we need to have something like tractability conditions. And uh, we should also have a smoothing and also some other uh, things satisfied. Uh, so if you learn the reference, you want to actually reflect that. You want to have that actually your system should be able to track that reference, that disturbance. You want to take constraints in these references into account and you want to filter the noise. And this you actually can also do with Gaussian processes. And what we develop for that is a very specific uh, process for doing constraint-based learning. So before we just learned and we didn't consider constraints like here on the reference. And what you can do is actually you can enforce these constraints and how do you do that? For this one keep in mind that the training operates by something what is called a hyperparameter optimization. So you have this one as pre-knowledge, then you get data and then you fit parameters of your learned model of your GP to the measurement. And uh, this actually exploits conditional probabilities, uh, Bayesian rules and so on. And this is actually how these things look like. So these are the so-called hyperparameters. So this is the optimization here, the mean, and here uh, kind of the covariance. And you can include these constraints in very specific ways in this hyperparameter optimization. And I don't want to dive too deep in here because this is actually rather time consuming. I just want to give you a feeling uh, how you can you now achieve stability. And for achieving stability, you need to keep in mind in optimal control, you need to do different things. We need to have constraint satisfaction and we also need to fit certain regions at the end of the horizon, so-called stability regions. And how do we do this meeting the um, kind of constraints uh, if we don't know what is exactly coming? And we actually do that with a reachability tube, which we add at each of these points taking our GP in uh, the learning into account. And so this we can do. And then we can also enforce our constraints and combining both of it, what we actually get is stability and safety. 
And what you get is actually a constrained hyperparameter optimization, looking roughly like this, uh, where we actually use a negative logarithm marginal likelihood function for the constraint satisfaction. And here you see the different constraints, the tubes for the reachability, and this is the safety. This actually, if you do it, and if you're able to find such a GP, then you have actual tractability up to time k. And can you prove now something? That's a good question. And actually it turns out, yes, if you do that in a correct way, so if you modify the optimization problem, uh, now here for the learning, and actually you check this as different points, and in between you do this uh, tractability conditions, and add the state constraints, then what you can actually show is that the posterior mean is tractable and it satisfies the constraint. So, combining that with MPC, what we have is actual, we have stability. So we learn a reference which we can track and for which we can also kind of guarantee stability. And how does this roughly look like? So this is an example which is very closely uh, to our uh, medical example. Here we have these tube constraints. I don't want to go much further into this point, but you see they change over time. This is kind of the reachability. And that's the resulting learned reference. And very important here, you actually see here we, with the red one, with the unconstrained learning, we do not meet the constraints. So the constraints down here, uh, this is actually not tractable because it's outside. Uh, so there is no tractability uh, in this one, but with the constraint-based thing, we actually achieve tractability. We achieve uh, that our GP is satisfying these constraints and that we actually can achieve stability in the closed loop. Okay, so this brings me to the end for the first part. And what I now want to focus on is, so far we only have learned the references. So far we have only learned references and disturbances. Can't we learn something on the system? And I want to just very briefly dive into this. And I want to show you that, yes, you can learn references. And here, as I said, I want to speed up a little bit. I want to focus on so-called input-output models. So we are only going for the moment to consider input-output models. And this means we are focused on this very specific kind of form of models to approximate our dynamics. So we will assume that actually our system kind of can satisfy that. So it's a so-called non-autoregressive system with exogenous inputs, could be nonlinear, has a noise term, has a disturbance, and the state here is actually the old outputs and the old inputs. And we have constraints, we have so-called output constraints. The objective now is we want to steer the system from an initial point to an endpoint to a target while guaranteeing this constraint so we don't want to leave the road, and we want to also provide guarantees on the robustness. Now the idea here is actually you use a GP for learning this NRX model, so you do that purely database with the same approach I have shown you, hyperparameter optimization, and this provides you a mean. Now for the moment we will only use this mean, so we will not use the covariance, this is future work, but we still want to know can we later on guarantee something. And since we don't use this uncertainty, we will actually use a nominal MPC formulation. So this is this one, this is the cost function here. It's a very specific cost function because it has a very specific end penalty term. And this is our model, which kind of forward predicts this NRX model plus the input constraint. The stage cost is actually here very specific. This is counting the distance and it's kind of the constraint on uh, the thing. And the question comes up, can we guarantee something? Can we guarantee stability? Can we guarantee performance despite this learning? And the important part also here is, if you formulate the things correctly, yes, you can guarantee stability. Uh, so you can actually guarantee stability of the MPC with this Gaussian process learned NRX model. If certain properties are satisfied, you need to have a terminal control law, you need to have a cost function, and then the error should be bounded. What is necessary for that? Actually, that the pure process is uniformly continuous, and actually that the error is bounded. And for this one, it's actually also very important 
that the nominal model you're using should be uniformly continuous. So if these conditions are satisfied, you can have input to state stability. This means small disturbances can have a small effect on the output in the closed loop. Now, this proposition here actually guarantees that you can also get that with GPs. I don't want to dive too far. It actually tells you that the covariance functional kernel needs to be continuously differentiable. And then the posterior mean function is uniformly continuous. So if you do that, it's very important. We can actually have stability of MPC and the Gaussian process. Let's look at an example again. Here now a completely different example, maybe a chemical reactor you want to run autonomously. This is actually known to be highly nonlinear. Uh, this is from a people from Seaborg. And what we used here for is actually we used uh, training points. We used 110 training points. They look like this one here. And you would say, well, never you would excite a chemical reactor like this. And that's true. We just wanted to show that this actually leads to something. And what you want to do is actually you want to control the concentration and the temperature and you want to make set point changes that we will see in a second. And maybe the first thing what you actually realize looking at this one this is the cross validation error with the GP. The error is actually very small if you look at these numbers here. So the GP model works very good if we are able to use excitation signals like this. How does the closed loop performance look like? And here we want to go from a certain concentration to another concentration. And uh, these are different realizations. Uh, and uh, the green one is actually the important one. Here you actually see our transition using the learned model. This one here is actually using, the red one is using the exact model. And this one would be using just a model uh, where some of the things are not correct. So the bottom line here is, also with learning here now, GP learning for this system model, the system dynamics, we also can guarantee things. Namely, you can have provable stability and safety of the closed loop. Okay. So, as I said, I am hurrying a little bit. Let me go to the last point. And the last point, I only want to give you a little bit of feeling. Can't we also learn the controller? And the idea here would be you actually learn the MPC controller. Maybe you learn the MPC controller, which is not stable. And as I said, only a brief glimpse. And the motivation for this is actually an interesting motivation. We want to learn a baseline controller. So we have a controller, which actually works fine, and we want to learn that. And why do you want to do that? Maybe because you want to have a car autonomously driving, or you want to decrease the computational load, or you would like to improve robustness and achieve stability. So this is the setup. We have a baseline controller. Maybe it's running in a loop, and we want to learn that controller, and maybe in the long run we want to improve that. So the question actually is, if we learn that controller, and if we now use here maybe a different approach, neural networks, can we achieve somehow stability? Can we show that the closed loop with the learned controller is stable? And in the long run, can we also enforce stability? And the key idea here is actually we are going to use Lyapunov stability conditions. And we are going to use a very specific network type, a so-called NAES network, non-autonomous input-output stable network. And we want to, uh, and we are going to the limit, so we will start with a finite number of layers and then we expand it to infinity and we exploit the properties of that to establish our results. This is the kind of model I will be using. So you see it's an input defined model. Here we work in continuous time. We have this baseline controller and we do not assume that the baseline controller is necessarily steep. What are now NAEs nets? NAEs nets are very specific uh, neural networks. Uh, they actually look like this. So this is a layer and this is a layer. Normally you have many layers here and they actually are close to look all the same. So they have uh, very similar weighting matrices. They actually share weight of matrices with one block. As I said, I don't want to go into details. So you can say we have here many layers. And the nice thing actually here is you can show certain things. There are certain uh, convergence results shown. If you use a tangent act activation function, then you can show that you actually have the convergence. You can enforce that in the training process. And this is what we are actually kind of exploiting. And what you actually can show is if you're using this result, if you start with an NAEs net with a finite number of layers, you can actually examine its property in a conservative way by going to infinite layer and considering the difference between the finite and infinite layers via disturbance term. 
And very important if you do that correctly, again without pointing out the details here in the theorem, becomes very lengthy, you can find it at the end, uh, you actually can achieve stability of the uh, system. And how does the stability result look like? It actually tells you that the NAE's net-based controller is stable if there are certain conditions on a matrix K which relates to the weighting are satisfied and if, if you have a minimum number of layers. So two things, we need to have uh, conditions on this matrix K uh, which kind of implies a, a quadratic Lyapunov function and then you need a certain number of layers. And so with this one we have a possibility to validate a deep or a neural network into closed loop and we can look for stability. And just an example here, again a uh, chemical reactor, again you have a concentration and temperature and you want to steer that. And here the red uh, and the blue are the NMPC controller. This is actually an MPC controller we used as a reference and we don't know if it's stable. And then the blue, the, the dotted lines here, these are actually learned controllers which we use these learning results from. They have a specific structure, these NAE snap, and we can show that they are stable. So the original NMPC controller was not stable, the DNN controller is actually stable. You should actually note this is a rather big network, uh, but we can ensure stability. Okay, so sorry for taking a little bit over time, this brings me to the end. Uh, what I wanted to show you is that using MPC uh, together with learning actually is very nice for autonomous systems. You can actually guarantee certain things. You can, under certain conditions, guarantee constraint satisfaction and stability, so your drone can learn and avoid objects. You can have many possible applications from robotics, manufacturing autonomous systems, and there's also tons of things. For example, I skipped something on looking at multiple modes. So you go to a crossing and other participants might have different objectives they want to do. It's called a multi-mode approach. You can ask your question, can I embed the learning and still guarantee something in the online control? And can I do something like multi-mode and learning? So all of these things are very nice and the take-home message is combining these two approaches is very promising. There are a lot of people working on that and I think actually this will be one of the key technologies in the future to look on. This brings me to the end. I also want to thank all the people here. Jenny Natchek, she mainly worked on a medical example. Michael Maivom, input-output models. Hong Hai and Tim Zieger uh, on this learning and all the others for their contributions. This brings me to the end. There's also a list of references you can look up of our work and I will be happy to answer.